Good morning. So I'm Mike Garrity. I'm, the, I'm the, the Chief Information Security Officer for the State of New Jersey. I'm also the Director of the New Jersey Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Cell. Um, how many are members of the NJ Kick? Wow, that, that, that's the most that we've ever had. So you know all about that, so I can just get off the stage. Um, so in, in just about three years ago, May 15, 2015, Governor Christie signed an executive order creating the NJ Kick as the state's one-stop shop for cybersecurity information sharing, threat intelligence, um, best practices, and incident reporting. So we act as a clearinghouse for the state of New Jersey for cybersecurity. Um, and if you go to our website, you can find all sorts of information about what we do. So some of the, you know, our charge is obviously to maintain, you know, and provide situational awareness of cyber threats that are impacting the state of New Jersey. And it's a public-private partnership, so it's not just within state government. This is a service that we provide for all of the citizens of New Jersey, all the businesses, academia, um, private and public sectors, and we focus a lot on critical infrastructure. The state of New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the nation, right? And it is the most digitally densely populated state in the nation as well. If you look at the infrastructure around here, up and down the turnpike, um, the threats, what you, you know, we realize are, are, are great. And, and so this is what the focus is for the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security. This is the focus of the NJ Kick. So three years ago, we started this NJ Kick and we started publishing bulletins making people aware of the threats, providing best practices, and the like. About a year later, what we did is, is we moved, or we transitioned, responsibility for information security, cybersecurity, within state government into the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness and out of the Office of Information Technology. And the purpose for this is that cybersecurity is seen as so important in this state that we didn't want it to be a backseat issue within an IT organization. Information technology organizations are, are built and, and organized to make things run. And they're never-ending problems that they have to deal with, never-ending demands. And as a result of that, cybersecurity sometimes takes a backseat. Well, we didn't want that to happen here in New Jersey, so we got out in front of it. We moved cyber into the uh, Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, and it's part of our three-pronged approach as far as counterterrorism is concerned, as far as preparedness for disasters, and as far as cybersecurity. So that's our three main missions within the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. And so the NJ Kick. Um, if you've been on our website, you received our bulletins, you see that you know, we're putting stuff out there on a regular basis. Um, our focus is on New Jersey, but we do interact with all sorts of other states. We have 44 states that are members. We have um, 24 countries that are members. We receive and share information with, with uh, folks like Interpol and Europol and other groups of, of the sort. So. We're pretty well structured, and we've grown from six individuals, six analysts, back in 2015. Now we have a staff of 32. And we continue to grow because this problem continues to grow, and it's a bigger and bigger issue all the time. So one of our focuses, one of my focuses as, as the director, is on training and education. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that Thomas Edison State University has a cybersecurity curriculum. There's a lot of other colleges and universities that are building cybersecurity curriculums. We do not have the trained staff members to handle cybersecurity today. Um, and, and this is what this focus is about. Over the past year, the NJ Kick, we have our own cybersecurity training curriculum. We've trained over 1,300 cyber defenders and cyber investigators on things like computer forensics, the basic network intrusion investigations. We put on several courses that were intended to prepare people to, to take their CISSP, their Certified Information System Security Professional Examination. And, and our goal is to continue that educational focus. Last month, or actually a couple of months ago, uh, we sponsored and organized something called Girls Go Cyber Start. 
Um, and the Girls Go Cyberstar Challenge was a, a, a national challenge focusing on high school females and providing them with an online challenge to get experience into what a career in cybersecurity might be. So online, you would do decryption and encryption. You would have to do basic coding. You'd have to do some internet investigations and the like stuff that we do in the real world of cybersecurity. We had 254 girls from New Jersey sign up, 168 teams from different high schools. They competed against 19 other states, 6,700 or so uh, girls from around the nation. We had a school in Bergen County, Bergen Academies, that placed third in the nation. Um, and then we had 15 other schools placed within the top 100 in the nation. And this was a lot of their first foray into cybersecurity. We're teaching coding in schools, we're teaching basic networking in schools and other things, but not necessarily cybersecurity at the high school level. So now this is what we've, we've got going on. We've got 254 captive students, females, um, that are, are interested in, in careers in this field. And so we're gonna to continue to expand that program within the K through 12 sections um, and continue to provide you know, training and education, not only to females in high school, but, but to males as well. And the reason we focused on females for this go round was if you look at the cybersecurity field, if you look into the audience, um, only 10% of the workforce in cybersecurity is made up of females. Okay, 90% is males. And so we wanted to provide that opportunity for females to do cyber in a structured environment where there was not that competition from males. Um, and, and as I said, a number of the girls that came away from that experience now plan to pursue careers in cybersecurity. Similarly, in the NJ Kick, we have a pretty robust internship program. And so we have interns from various colleges and universities across the state. Um, we try and keep about six every semester, um, six over the summer and the like. Um, we'd love to have more if we had the space, but we gotta find more space. So what we've done is we're, we're really taking kids that don't have that experience in cybersecurity, may not have a background. We want math majors and physics majors and, and engineering majors and music majors to provide them with an opportunity. Cybersecurity goes beyond just penetration testing or ethical hacking. Um, it takes all things. Um, in order to be successful, we need creative writers for us to be able to put out our bulletins and publish our information so that individuals can understand it, lay people. It can't just be bits and bytes for the technology people. So this is what we're trying to do. Out of our internship program this last semester, we have two college uh, interns. One took a job you know, at AT&T as a cybersecurity engineer full-time. One took a job at, at Verizon as a cybersecurity engineer full-time. One is going to the NSA. And what is interesting about those three is neither one of them were interested in cybersecurity before they came to the NJ Kick. So we need to open up the eyes of what this field is, what we do, and how important it is. And that's what we're trying to do. The threats that we have, um, we monitor what we call the Garden State Network. Uh, the Garden State Network is the network for state government agencies. So everything from the Department of Treasury to labor, um, anything and everything with government agencies. It's the New Jersey Turnpike Authority. It's part of New Jersey Transit. It's just about every municipality and every county in the, in the state of New Jersey. And when I say municipalities, um, if you were coming here today and you got pulled over by a police officer and they ran your driver's license, that connection from the mobile data terminal goes in to the Garden State Network and does a driver's look up down in Trenton. And so this is what we're trying to protect and it's a pretty wide network. We see on a monthly basis approximately five million attacks against the Garden State Network. Five million that, that are classified as moderate, high, or critical. And the critical ones being that if they were successful, they would compromise the network completely. Right? So we have five million attacks coming from all over the world. It's, you know, there are no borders as far as cybersecurity is concerned. Most of it is, is financially motivated, um, although there are also nation states and other individuals or other groups that, that want to hack into it. At the same time, 
We have 60,000 state employees. And on a daily basis, we see more than 4 million emails coming into the state of New Jersey to those employees. We're blocking 85% of those emails. So if you do the math, we're, we're blocking quite a lot because it contains malware, it contains phishing information. So this is part and, and parcel of what we do every day. Our job in the kick, not only to block and defend it and, and, and to investigate if things happen, is also to provide this information, share it out with the public sector, with the private sector, so that you are aware of the threats that we're seeing, because I can guarantee you if they're attacking us, they're attacking you with the same thing. We treat our, our Garden State Network, and I shouldn't say this publicly, especially if it's being taped, um, as almost like a honey network. Um, it is something that we want to be able to share. We don't operate in a classified environment, even though many of us in the NJ Kick and Homeland Security you know, have, have top secret or, or secret classifications. We want to be able to share it. If we can't share it, then this ecosystem of cybersecurity is not going to work. Right? So the threat is real, and it's not only threats from outside, it's from inside. Uh, that focus that we put on cybersecurity and the reason that you know, we, we moved it out of IT is for the purpose of being able to focus on these threats, being able to respond to these threats, and being able to provide a coordinated response. So some of the things that we're doing there. Right. I grew up, and there's the Colgate clock that's over there. It's analog in 2018. It was analog in 1961 when I was born, just a few blocks away. Um, but this whole downtown area has changed. And to date, we've focused cybersecurity efforts mostly on protecting data. So we hear about data breaches every day. In the NJ Kick, we receive approximately 20 reports per week of organizations that have suffered data breaches impacting New Jerseyans. In the past year, about 4,500,000 New Jerseyans have been the victims of a data breach, and a lot of that is attributed to the Equifax breach um, just not too long ago. And, and so the focus on personally identifiable information and data has driven a lot of the regulatory environment, a lot of the cybersecurity efforts that we have. But in a few years, data breaches are going to seem pedestrian for the challenges that we have. You look around Jersey City and you see buildings. Um, just a few years ago, we, we started with iPhones and the first smartphones. Those smartphones turned into you know, smart thermostats and smart doorbells and smart TVs. And we have smart homes today. And we're going to have smart neighborhoods. And we're going to have smart cities and autonomous vehicles. And we're going to have all sorts of problems that come along with those things. And the problem for us today is we're not really thinking about the security. We're thinking about all the benefits, the, the conveniences that it provides us. It's great that I can use my phone and turn on the air conditioning before I get home, or turn off the coffee pot, or do these types of things. But if you think of intelligent traffic systems, all of us came in today, and if you took the turnpike, it was a mess. If you took one and nine, it was a mess. Um, but intelligent traffic systems, as you're going to the turnpike to Holland Tunnel, it tells you it's going to take approximately 45 minutes on a variable message sign. How do they know that? Well, that's data coming out of your phone, your Bluetooth, that signaling sensors on the roadway telling you what speed you're moving at. And from that, they can take that telemetry data and predict how long it's going to take to get there. Right? Traffic signals are going to be coordinated and synchronized based on traffic conditions and other things that sensors are picking up, so these smart cities, if you will. But what happens when we have a problem with those sensors or those smart cities? You know, one of the problems and one of the things that we're working on in, in Homeland Security is, is we're trying to take cybersecurity and converge it with Homeland Security and converge it with preparedness. Down in South Jersey, Fork and River is the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant. If the alarm were to go off, there are evacuation routes to get out of that Fork and River area in Ocean County. However, if somebody hacks in to the traffic signals or something goes wrong, it can create mass gridlock, kind of like it's out here every day. 
And if it creates mass gridlock down there, it can lead to mass casualties. So these are the challenges that we see in cybersecurity going forward. Not so much, I, I know I've been the victim of probably 20 data breaches from Home Depot to Target to OPM to all these others. Everybody has my information. The privacy is gone, Facebook has it, and, and, and obviously if I'm driving, somebody's picking up my Bluetooth signal and, and can track me. Those things are always going to be there. Last week, I was standing online um, at Reader's Water Ice, and just in, you know, near my hometown. And as I was standing there, the, the, the lights and sirens were going by, and it was the paramedics followed by the, the ambulance, followed by the hazmat crew, followed by the fire trucks and the police cars. And today, we have paramedics providing first aid and, and, and emergency life-saving situations to aid to individuals that are injured or, or sick, okay? We have hazmat teams cleaning up spills and responding to those types of things. We have fire departments putting out fires, and we have, you know, police obviously responding. So we have all these first responders. But when the intelligent traffic sy system goes down and the smart city goes down, who are going to be the cyber first aid teams? And who are going to be the cyber first responders? And that's the world that we're looking at as we move this forward. So these careers in cybersecurity are real. They're beyond just blocking things at firewalls. They're actually going into the quality of life and the health and human services, uh, health and human safety aspect of our lives, because it's no longer just about data. It's integrated in every aspect of our life. Um, I can't stress enough how exciting this is to be able to think about it and to come up with solutions. And you know, Thomas Edison and other universities preparing individuals to take careers in cybersecurity. We need to think of it from human terms, okay? From people terms, not just in technical terms. You know, the, the you know, smart buildings, smart cities, um, that is the future. Autonomous vehicles. Um, we did a, a recent exercise with the Department of Homeland Security um, called Operation Cyberstorm. It was a national event. And in the scenario, um, individuals hacked into a, a water company here in New Jersey, a water purveyor. And what they did is they, you know, changed the, the PLC, uh, the programmable logical, logic controller, because it had a vulnerability in it. And they were able to put more chlorine in the water, right? With everything being connected, it's no longer just a, 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 an incident, a cyber incident, or a hack of a system. It's things that can really impact society. And it's not only going to be terrorists, it's going to be everybody else looking for financial gain. It's going to be nation states. Uh, later today, I go and I testify before the Assembly Homeland Security Committee. And I guarantee I'll probably have 30 questions on election security. Okay. Election security is something that we've been focusing on as well. And we can talk about all sorts of different things there as far as security is concerned. Every aspect of our lives is going to be integrated into cybersecurity or cybersecurity is going to be integrated there. This is not something that a few specialists can handle. This is something that everybody's going to be, a, be need, need to be aware of, not just clicking on links or opening up unsolicited emails but the entire ecosystem and how to protect ourselves from the design and manufacture of, of IoT devices uh, to programmable logic controllers, operational technologies and the like. This is our future and this is why this is so important. So with that, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna put up one slide um, for any other information that you want from the NJ Kick. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll move that manually, um, and take questions if anybody has them. Sir.
Great question, and, and thank you for asking that. And, and, and I mentioned that we put on a training class for CISSP you know, before, right? In order to get a CISSP, you got to go through the training, you got to take the test, um, and you've, you've got to have four years' experience. If you look on the job boards, whether it be LinkedIn or Monster or any of those job boards, they're all, you know, there are 250,000 cybersecurity jobs that are being advertised in New Jersey. Not in New Jersey, in the United States. And 150,000 of those jobs are either requiring or ask or preferring individuals that have their CISSP, which is fine, except there's only 75,000 CISSPs in the world. Right? So 250,000 jobs, 150 that want them, all those 75,000 are fully employed. And so you see a bidding war and a lot of competition for that small group. But there's no opportunity for those that are just getting into the field. Right? And this is a problem. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do, so I mentioned we have an internship program at the NJ Kick. I look at us as a feeder system for the rest of New Jersey. Our job is to provide qualified individuals, give them experience so that we can provide that out and they can go to the at ts and they can go to the Verizons with real world experience. When people come to us and they do internships, they're not you know, making coffee and, and, and folders and stuff. They're actually defending the networks. They're learning more and, and the reason why people are coming in and then going out and getting jobs is because Companies know that they're trained and have this. So one of the things that we're looking to do is hire veterans because we know the discipline, we know they can work as teams, we know they're valuable. A few years ago, when I was uh, with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, there was a program run by DHS, which is the HEROES program, which took injured vets and put them into and gave them training and provided them with jobs working with DHS and other states and organizations to find missing and exploited children, right? And a lot of it was doing forensics on, on bad actors and uh, their computers and their systems and stuff like that. So that was one way we got veterans into it. We can provide more opportunities at those entry levels and provide that type of training. We have to provide that type of training on the job and continue that through. The problem a lot of companies face and a lot of organizations face is that once you train somebody up, they become very valuable. And they can demand money because of the cybersecurity pool that's out there. And they are apt to leave and go and chase that money. Uh, and and I, I've said this to my director and everybody within our Office of Homeland Security and state government, that's fine if they want to leave. Because we, I look at ourselves as the oak tree and these are the acorns. And having cybersecurity in the cities or businesses protects the state of New Jersey no matter if they're in the NJ kick or they're in some, some other company. So yeah, we, we can do a lot better. We need to provide training programs and opportunities for individuals you know, at that entry level to get them in there. Sir. So, so I, I think we're mixing and matching some things here. We publish a bulletin, you'll get it today. Uh, it's our weekly bulletin, it goes out every Thursday. That is public information. And we use what's called a traffic light protocol, TLP. TLP white meaning that it can be distributed to everybody. There's not sensitive information that, that we need to protect. Then there's TLP green, okay, which is we're only going to provide that to individuals in certain sectors. You can share it, but don't share it widely because, you know, it has certain information. TLP amber has more identifying information and more sensitive information 
that's more closely held. And then TLP Red is really restricted. That doesn't go anywhere. Most of the information that we put out is TLP White. There is no restriction there. When we send things out, and, and, and when I say a membership of 6,500 or so, we have members from every different critical infrastructure sector you can imagine, from the water sector, from the energy sector, from financial sectors. And what we want to do, instead of just blasting everybody with spam, we're going to send, if you're in the energy sector, things that are relevant to the energy sector. But those things that are relevant to the energy sector, that are working cybersecurity issues, they should be kept in the energy sector because they are kind of sensitive. But the stuff that uh, you know just normal individuals get, it's mostly TLP white. Um, there are other things that we pass through. Um, from FBI um, public notifications to MSI SAC notifications that may be TLP green um, or amber in some cases, but most of the stuff that we distribute is TLP white. So it's freely distributable. It's going to be on our website, so there, there are no restrictions on that. Sir. We know that uh, cybersecurity incidents, incidents, malware, uh, fraud, and whatnot have disastrous implications for individuals, families, small businesses in the state of New Jersey. Um, what can we do to educate you know, the public, these small businesses in the state of New Jersey on the, on the, the risks, especially the financial risks that they would face um, uh, for, you know, if they were to be compromised, not patching their systems and whatnot? You know, what can we do to, to possibly educate them? So we, we've got a pretty good program as far as security awareness best practices that we bring out to businesses, that we bring out to schools and, and organizations all over the place. I have a partnerships bureau. That's all they do is they're up and down the state providing uh, these types of presentations to make people aware. Um, obviously, they can subscribe to the NJ Kick. We want to be that clearinghouse where we can provide relevant and insightful information for your, your customers, for the neighbors, for, for the whole community and stuff. So there's a lot of those things. You mentioned patching, okay? Patching is the wrestling match between the security organization and the IT organization. And a lot of times, the IT organization is going to win. If you look at the Equifax breach, they didn't patch an Apache struts vulnerability on a public-facing web server. And as a result, 145 million or whatever it is, individuals in the United States had their, their identities breached. Um, this is something that, you know, it, it, really within organizations, it's got to be moved out of IT and moved into what I call a chief risk officer. What is the risk if we don't do this? And in business terms, you can quantify risk, okay? What is the reward if we do do it? And what is it, the impact? Um, so there's a lot that we can do, a lot more that we can do. Um, one of the series that we'll be starting um, relatively soon is a, an online series um, via YouTube and, and on the webinars and those types of things. We just started another campaign called Be Sure to Secure, which provides individuals with really common sense information on how to secure their, whether it be a Facebook account, a Twitter account, Instagram, or, or their home network and stuff, so that citizens will have this, not just big businesses or, or banks or, or others. Other questions? All right. Thank you for your time. Good luck going forward. <laughs>